These two were designed by a really, really smart guy called Alex Osterwalder, who's been applying this. He wrote the book, Business Model Generation. Um, really useful. However, as the owner of a software development company, and as most people in product development, what happens is I get people coming in with a one-day solution. They're like, this is what I want to build. And they, they paint out that full picture. However, there is an imaginary customer at this point who we assume has a desire, a want, a thing they're trying to fulfill, and that they do a bunch of jobs to get that done. And at this stage, you know, you're generally dismissive about the current process. You say it sucks, or no one does it, or whatever it is, it really sucks. So, what happens is everybody gets fixated on this one day and tries to build there, or even if they start in the beginning, it's like, oh, I'm building this to get to one day. And, and we don't focus on how do we do this early stage learning. And I, found, I was finding it really, really difficult to convince entrepreneurs, not quite like you, these are people who'd come to me to build software, so they were very clearly, I need this one day. Oftentimes they would have money, so they'd been able to convince someone that the one day was worth building. And I needed to tell them what you need to do is go out and start iterating. And the first iterations you need to do is see how people currently do this. So I believe people want a TV. How do people currently get a TV? Right? They go to a shop, they do this thing, they look around, they ask their friend. But you're going to need to go and find out how people find TVs. And the job is, how do people browse for TVs, how do people buy TVs, and how do people get them to their house and install them? So those are maybe the three big jobs that they do to achieve their desire of having a TV at home. And now you're imagining that in your one-day solution, there's this magical flock of drones that's going to bring you different sized TVs and hover them in your lounge and pop them on the wall, and then the little like pay wave drone comes and like swaps your wallet. <laughs> Yeah, and like, whoa, the money goes away and the TV appears on the wall. And that's your one-day solution. If you start trying to do that, you'll spend all your time trying to get the pay wave drone and, you know, you're cutting people's bums with propellers. It's a bad <laughs> idea. Um, you, you need to be checking out how do people currently do it and then how do competitors do it. Uh, I don't know if you guys in your training have come across the technology adoption life cycle. I will. Yeah, it's, it's a good idea. So, very briefly, we can talk a long time about this life cycle, and it's very insightful and something you need to think about down the line. But, for the purposes of this, to understand the difference between current and competitors, how your competitors do it, in the beginning I'm going to say current and competitors, like, isn't the way people currently do it my competitor? So, the competitors are people who are trying to solve that problem in a better way, and new things that are happening. Traditionally, we think of technology adoption shaped like this, that you've got, you've got a new technology. In the beginning, a few people use it, and then more people use it, and then you start to get more, and you get to the edge of the market, and then eventually you get to the tail. So this is the number of new users. This isn't the total number of people using it. So the beginning, a few new users, then lots, and then, wow, it's amazing, and then, whoa, what's happening to the technology? Because you're saturating the market, and then eventually you get to the old grannies and grandpas and the last person that Coca-Cola is trying to reach on the hill in the Andes somewhere, and they're painting houses red to try to convince that person to buy a Coke. But that's a saturated market, Coke versus Pepsi. Whereas trying to invent a new thing here, you get your early adopters. An important insight is that it doesn't quite look like this. The beginning goes like this, and there's another chasm, not the chasm I was talking about earlier, but this is this is crossing a chasm in its this book called Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore. I think now I've confused my names. But essentially the early adopters get started. These are people who like trying new things, and you can get good signal from it. But then the early majority, they wait a bit. And they want to see how this thing works out. And a lot of times startups will go, ah, yay! And then why aren't we getting new customers? Why aren't we getting new customers? You keep beating the drum, trying different things, and you get into the early majority. Because those people just wanted to wait and see if it. So the current is this section here. How do most people do it? Early majority, late majority. How are people doing it at the moment? So with the TV example, they go to game and macro. 
How are my competitors trying to help with it? Take a look. Uh, there's someone trying to address the problem in a new way. Early adopters might buy their TV or take a look. I bought my TV, I take a lot because I could do that at two in the morning because I have kids, so I don't have time during the day. <coughs> so I've got a special thing that pushes me into being an early adopter, being willing to buy a TV without touching it. Yeah. And maybe the drone helps resolve that problem, but you look at the early adopters. And the mission I give people that actually convinces people to get out of the building in the beginning is that you've got to get out and harvest the pain. You've got to go out and look for the things the way it currently happens and the way your competitors do it that suck, that are painful, that are wrong with that. Because all of that is money in the bank with your investors. When you say, you're literally grabbing these golden nuggets from the market and putting them in your pocket so that when someone says to you, what's your idea? You're, Did you know that people are spending half an hour to drive to the mall, not knowing what the TVs are, the salesmen suck, they haven't been trained, all of these things happen. My drones will solve all of this. You know. Uh, but the point is you find all of that pain and you discuss the payment problems and the credit cards that don't work and the signing of things and getting a TV license. You find all of that pain and you think about how you can address that pain. So the job of the first two iterations is really harvesting pain. And then once you've got an idea of these pains and how the value stream goes, and we're going to value stream mapping a bit later, then we start doing experiments. But if... if yeah. So the pain, is, is, is there a definition for what a pain is, or is it anything that people... We we'll get a bit more into that in the value function canvas with that. Today or today? So the problem is, though, that you will do this one day. You'll think about your product, you'll dream about your product, your product will put blinkers on you, they'll kick in all your biases to try to see things as a product. And the problem with that is, it's a trap. <laughs> it's a scary trap that's going to, like, take you into this big ambush. And that big ambush is your brain working against you, it's the customer fighting you because they don't want what you want, you're trying to force something down people's throats, no one likes that, and it's a horrible, scary trap. So the thing you need to do when you get to building is start thinking about how you can move towards your one day through tiny, tiny, tiny experiments. And the first experiments that you're going to do after observing is actually delivering with delivering value to the market with a concierge MVP. So most of us have been into a hotel lobby. This magical person in a hotel lobby called the concierge. They run around and they make that hotel work. They greet you at the door, they check that you know where you need to go, they'll carry your bag if the, the person isn't there, they'll even check you in if stuff's not working. They, they just make it work. And they give you the VVIP treatment. So in the concierge stage of your startup, you give your customers the VVIP treatment. You go and talk to them, so the TV. Hey, you're thinking about being, buying TV. How did you decide on the TV? Let, let me show you all the brochures. I'm going to learn about TVs. I'm going to bring in people who understand about TVs. I, like, let me go to your house and figure out what your TV needs are. Uh, just see what your signal sources are. Like, let me really learn and give you the best possible TV experience and get you through all of those jobs. Finding a TV, paying for it, delivering, I'm going to bring it to you. I'm going to drill the holes. Like, let me make that amazing for you and find the best experience possible to deliver that. And I'm going to do it myself. That does not scale. Right? At this stage, you're doing things that don't scale. Because your number of customers is what? <laughs> you can't serve a thousand customers like this. You don't have a thousand customers. Actually, you have zero customers. So with zero customers, you can do it much as you want for all of them, and it's not going to cost you anything. Once you have that first customer, it's going to cost you a little bit. But the, your competitive advantage as a startup is that you don't have customers. If you're a large business, suddenly you need to address a million customers, and the thing you do has to work. And the thing you do has to be cheap and efficient, and inside of all these constraints of business, and has to have governance, and all of these things are pulling you down. If you remember the business model canvas, on the one side you've got the customer, with revenue, and on the other side you've got all your business activities with your costs, and they're like a scale, right? And in a traditional business, the scale has to balance and it has to like generate a bit more money so it can go off into the profits and keep, keep things going. In a startup, it's not like that. So this is your revenue and these are your costs here. Your costs are like this, and there's just no revenue. Right? This arm doesn't even exist yet because you don't know where it comes from. And the goal is to kind of figure out how you can 
put down some of those costs for a bit, so now at least you've just got an arm, which is still heavier than nothing, and then suspend gravity for a bit, so that you can like show how this business works. In the money world, how you suspend gravity is money. So you get some fun. You borrow some money, you take it from your savings, and you just say, like, I'm going to do things that don't scale to try to show how this balance balances, and how I can deliver value to these customers through the business model canvas. And then you're also suspending gravity because you don't have governance. You haven't even incorporated a business yet necessarily. You're not having AGNs. You're not doing like terms and conditions for going to someone's house to drill holes in the wall to put give them a TV. It's just your friend. You're helping them put in the TV, right? So if you were inside of a corporate, you'd have to take past risk, legal compliance, and you'd die before you even started. Yeah. Sorry. So, I mean, everything. Well, not everything. Isn't the idea to do that with the one customer as if, so there's this whole thought that offer the service like you would mm. with a thousand. Why is this so, so so this the, really different? So you're, you're trying to give them what you imagine the service will be, but you don't have any of the automation underneath to do it. So you're faking it completely. You're trying to make them feel, and you're learning, learning what the customer wants. At this stage, you don't even know. But in, in that, so if they buy into that or they enjoy that experience, how then do you know that they'll enjoy it with that? So you haven't validated that at all. What you validated there is that customers want TVs in this way, and now your next step is to try to automate away a bit of that. So the next step might be, after a bunch of consumers, might be to fake a piece of the system. To say, here is a website where you can buy TV. And when they put in the, what they're looking for, you do it on the back end yourself. And then you send them an email, and then you say, these are the TVs I found for you, choose one, and then they choose one, and you go, okay, order from take a lot, get the TV, and you go and sell it. So, so, so a case study of that, um, looking at exactly that. So in the home cleaning space, there's a company in the US called Homejoy. They've recently shut down for various reasons, but when that founder wanted to start her business, she first took a job, she's a Stanford grad, took a job as a, in a cleaning company, and went around for three months did their training, went around and cleaned people's houses for three months. After that, she's like, great, I know exactly how to clean a house. I know, I understand that intrinsically. Now I want to do this as a business. So they put up a one-page landing page, which is say, we clean houses in the Bay Area. This is the price. When the booking came through, she went and cleaned the first hundred houses. So she went and she was her product for a while. And then they started automating that. And um, I'll use another example of, so that was like very early stage, concierge really experienced that. One of the companies we built, another cleaning company, um, is um, called Domestly, which is um, domestic work, a marketplace for domestic workers. Now when they started, Berno's got a little bit of coding experience, so he spent half a day putting up a one page landing page using uh, Wix, I think it was, one of the simple website builders, with a link to a form. At the end of the form, it redirected you to Payfast, um, you set it all up, all up in a day. That form would send him an email to book a cleaning for a session. Um, and so this is an example of faking it. So at the book a cleaning for a session, he would then get that email. He had an Excel spreadsheet of all the different cleaners. He would phone them, check who was available, email the client back on a very official automated looking email saying, booking confirmed for this date. Um, and then what he would do, on the, on the day before the booking, he would SMS uh, the Google Maps direction step by step to the cleaner, make sure it was there. At 6 o'clock that or 7 o'clock that morning, he would phone the cleaner, check that she's en route, that she's going to be on time. When, um, if she was going to be running late, he would contact the thing, say, send them an official looking SMS saying, the cleaner is delayed by 15 minutes. <laughs> and so from the customer's experience, they went to her website, they filled, up, filled out a booking, um, they went and redirected them to a payment thing, they got an email to confirm their booking, the cleaner rocked up at their house, did the cleaning, and they got a, a phone call uh, at the end saying, how did you rate their cleaning? Now that was a completely manual process. He did his first 40 bookings like that over a three month period, trying to work it out in the Stellenbosch area, getting it. And then he came to us and said, I need to build some tech. And I said, great. Um, and then like explaining he unpacked it all, I was like, okay, well, you're coming up to like, why do you need to build tech? He's like, well, we're coming up to Christmas, so we want to really land this whole uh, 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 holiday house market. Um, so I was like, okay, great, you're not going to build tech. And he was like, what do you mean? And I said, well, go raise 100,000 Rand, hire four people or five people, and in that period, he did 100 bookings in the month of December. Still no tech. Still doing everything manually. But when they eventually came back to us, 
they knew exactly what they needed to build. They knew how the systems needed to work, what the checks and balances were, what information needed to be where. They, they really experienced exactly what the technology was they needed to build. And so that's kind of the last step of making it. But those first iterations, and that's what this whole process is around, is designing the iterations that you're, that you're working towards. And well, how can you do those manually? How can you do them with a little bit of technology or a little bit of process or a flyer, a flyer or, a or, or, or a put up a sell somebody uh, t-shirts and then go and buy the t-shirts, like manually go to the store and go and deliver it. Like how can you do it concept or make it look like it's automated even though it's not before you move into buying the warehouse and the supplier from China and getting all the things. Just Buy the TV from Take A Lot and then go and resell it. Even if you're not making any money on it, you're understanding how the process works. You're getting customers. You're doing customer validation, even though you're not making money. So the make it step is what we generally think about in businesses. That's hard, right? It's expensive. It takes time. It takes a bunch, bunch of like yourself into it. We had a story from the back about how it kills you if it doesn't work. That's really, really hard. Just try to imagine how hard that is, and then times that by 10. It's challenging, it's hard, it's expensive. One part, hard part of it is building software, which is something that takes passion and talent and pouring people into it and making that happen. And it's expensive. One of the, most, one of the best paid professions in South Africa is software development. So you're paying really big salaries when you come to software development. Another of the really well paid salaries is lawyer, which is for the company creator. And then accounts. You know, these are these are top tier salaries that you're going to have to hire when you come to creating your company. So leave that for as long as you can, because it's a lot cheaper to change before you've written the contracts, before you've written the software, before you've done that stuff, and then it gives you this fluidity of being able to change. So another story, because we've told a few stories about faking it, and I don't want you to think that faking it is the first step. So there's a startup called Lawyer Up. I don't know if anyone's seen or used Lawyer Up yet. Um, it's a site where you can go and say what your legal problem is, and then lawyers will get in touch with you and give you quotes to solve that problem for you. It's a really nice idea for a service. It's not exactly what they started out with, either. It's similar. But when Moira, who's a lawyer himself, or qualified as a lawyer, um, came to me with a business idea, and a big, well, an idea for a spec. I said to her, she should, well, what should my budget be? I said, I don't know. What should, like, how long is it going to take you to build this? I don't know. I don't know if that's the right thing. Luckily for her and for us in this scenario, she'd just been through working with a traditional studio, ad, ad, ad studio, and they said, oh, we can build this for you in three months, and they had no idea what it was, and five months later, they had nothing. Luckily for her, she was a lawyer, she got most of her money back from them. And then she came out again, and I gave, I told her what she wanted to hear, which was, I don't know. <laughs> and then she said, okay, well, you've said that, but what do I do? And I said, well, the thing you do is you go and concierge this, right? You're a lawyer, you're convincing, you're a bunch of things. Go, go to a boardroom table with your potential customers, go sit across the table from them, and explain to them what you're going to do. You're going to ask them what their problem is, and then you're going to find lawyers for them, get them quotes, and go and try to sell it. And in those first sales, the business model did change. It changed completely because she spoke to the customers, she found out what their needs were, she had ways that she was going to try to connect them with customers and subscription. But all of those things were questions in the air and hadn't even contacted the customer and found out what their pains were, that, that law was scary, that even at big companies people are copy-pasting contracts off the internet and editing them because it's so hard to find a, a lawyer. Uh, it's costly, it's difficult to engage with the lawyer, there's a scary part of law, you don't want to be wrong, the cycle times are high, lawyers are... All of this learning that she picked up by talking to people across the table. And then, we'd, then through those conversations, she was able to actually get some sales. People bought her service, were willing to pay for her, uh, pay, pay the commission to find the lawyers. And then we took it to the next step, which was, will people do this over email? If you remove yourself from this mix, and you're a very compelling human, you're a lawyer, and all of these things, and you're the salesman, so now let's up the friction a bit. If you do this over email, will people buy? So, you know, you, you find, you approach companies over email, and you'll see if you do it. Also, it's a very cheap build, because you can type an email, 
you send an email to people and see if you can convert. And there's a very interesting story from this. There was a guy, one of her first customers was in the same office as one of her actual friends. And he called everyone in the office to come to his desk and he said, guys, I emailed this company and lawyers have sent me quotes. So come look, like they're actually telling me how much this is going to cost and giving me advice and all I did was send an email. Because lawyers are scary. You know, what they all do with their suits and their offices and their staff and their terms. But now you write your question and, you, and that was amazing validation for her to hear the story of this guy calling and had, had seven of his co-workers around the desk and she was like, this is good. And we took the next stage, which was, would people type it into a landing page? Because we didn't know if email was a more trusted channel. So we then did a channel assumption test on a landing page, and then event, at that point we got to the fake it step. But in those early steps, she was receiving the email, mailing out all the lawyers who actually were relevant to it, getting their answers back, formatting it into a PDF document, putting it together with her thing, putting the quote in, sending it to customers, and one of the first pains for her wasn't a customer facing pain, it was these PDF documents. <laughs> they take forever, right? So we built a small piece of tech to automate the PDF generation. In that, we validated what should be in the PDF so that when we build the website one day, there's not days and days of questions. We know that goes into the PDF, these are the inputs, and she could type in each of the inputs, paste the lawyer's response, and ta da! She's got the PDF documents to mail to the lawyers. And then, Interestingly, generating those PDFs revealed that it was a bit tricky to always put the commission in and customers were asking, why am I paying you this commission? What's happening? And in the law society, you're not allowed to, it's a legal rule or whatever it's called in South Africa, that you're not allowed to, probably law, um, you're not allowed to put commission onto legal services without saying what they are, exactly what it is. And this was turning off clients because they didn't know how they were doing it. And also it was a bit of a bugbear in the business model because other companies had already been doing this. We'll find you a lawyer and then you pay commission forever to work with that lawyer. And that kind of sucks because they found that their business model was more of a finder's fee for lawyers and companies were, lawyers were asking, well, if you find me business, I keep paying you, this doesn't work for us. And so we sat on that tension for a while and went, well, what if the lawyers paid you a fee permanently? to be on the platform. Now you're incentivized to do all the marketing because there's cost per click marketing and all of that to find them more leads um, to keep them on the platform. But now the lawyers pay a flat fee, it's not a commission. So we moved that out, made the customers happier because they're not paying a commission. You're always happier if the lawyer pays a fee but you're not paying that fee directly. Because there's a step of indirection, you're paying that fee but you're not. And it's not something you have to be, like the pain that has to be visited on the customer. So removing that pain helped move that story along and also changed the business model around to be, in this case, actually better aligned with the customer's interest on both sides, the lawyer and the customer. Because uh, now the lawyers are driving the platform to try to get more leads out of it. Because they don't mind if they get more leads. It's not like, oh, I found this by the platform and then charge them more money. So just the story of how you go through concierging and delivering the value. And at each step, what do we want to learn? We want to learn, will people buy this? We want to learn, will they buy it over email? We want to learn, will they type in their, their sensitive legal problem onto a, a form? And that is going to be a workshop to do, I think, right now or after? Right now. Right now. Just time. Right now. Yeah. Right now. Um, so there's a worksheet that's going to come out with what are the jobs that you think people do? How do they currently do it? What do competitors do? We're not going to do iteration design here. We're just going to write down what you think your one day solution is. So, because this bears repetition, the jobs are in the TV example browse for a TV, buy a TV, get it delivered. Currently, they go to Macro and look at TVs, they use their credit card, and that's how they live into their house. Competitors yes, take them up. And our one day solution is all the drones and stuff that we're imagining. This can be hard if you haven't thought about the jobs that your customers do yet. So if you haven't like thought what jobs am I doing for your customer, that's a valuable thing to do now. Think about the jobs you're doing for your customer with your solution. What do they want? So at the top of the sheet you'll see there's a sponsoring thought. I want a TV. What is the thing that they want? 
and then what are the jobs that they have to do to get that done? Importantly, start with currently. Like, what do they have to do currently? If you remove it, you can just do a big X at the end. So, you know, if you magically find people, a lawyer, for example, it's like going to speak to lawyers gone. You know, or we do it via email. Or, you know. But the first steps, the first step is spend some time on the jobs. And if it feels hard, if it is hard, think about it. Think about the jobs you do. But write your sponsoring thought across the top as well. What do people want? And there's one in your workbook. There's one in a pack here. If you need to use more, use more. If you have a marketplace player, use one for each side, one for the supplier and one for the consumer. This is really a chance to just understand the jobs that people do.